Thank you, thank you, Lorraine. You know, I heard the Rachel Maxey blooper music in the background when we did that. Yeah. Cher Horowitz <laughs> would be the first to die if she was in Ready or Not. She actually really belongs in that movie. Yeah, she does. She... <laughs> yeah. Hello, Hello everyone. everyone. Scrivener here. Michaela, Scrivener's girlfriend. You know this. Happy quarantining, everybody. So you came to visit at the beginning of March. All the flights have been canceled. So you're here for a little while longer, mm -hmm. which is nice, but also like, we're just trying to be safe and keep ourselves occupied yeah. during this very unprecedented time. But we hope you are all being safe and taking care of yourselves and each other. If you can, if at all possible, stay inside and do whatever you can just to stay safe and comfy. And so at the beginning of the month, before all of this stuff kind of happened, we went out and saw the new Emma movie. Emma? <laughs> Emma, period. Literally, that is how it's summarized. Yeah. We really, really enjoyed it. Me, who had watched one other adaptation, was like, oh, I should really show you the BBC miniseries. Like, you'll understand all of the characters and what's going on a lot better. I enjoyed the film, but... It required some explanation. Yeah. Which is something that we've realised is quite common to Jane Austen adaptations because she stuffs a lot in there. But it made me think, oh, how many other Emma adaptations are there? I think we can basically describe what we did as four Emmas and a Clueless. We watched all the versions of Emma from the 90s up to today. Last 25 years. I want to throw us both under the bus with a disclaimer here that we have not read the book. No, we've but only just started reading it. We're only like three or four chapters in. So our ranking and discussion of these different adaptations is not going to be informed by how faithful it is to the original source material and how well like the themes from that are preserved. We can talk about how we enjoyed it as somebody who has not read the book and also just our general feelings as like viewers of, you know, a visual medium. Basically what we thought of each one. Yeah, and what we liked and what we didn't like so much. And which ones we feel like are worth watching and which ones maybe are not yeah. so much. And it can get complicated because there are elements of some which stand out uh, amongst an adaptation which maybe doesn't stand out as a whole. Alright. Emma! <laughs> First up is Clueless, which came out in 1995, directed by Amy Heckerling. You had never seen it before. I'd never seen it before. It's a contemporary adaptation yes. set at the time that it was made in Beverly Hills. None of them have the same names except for Elton, which I think yes. is an interesting touch. Yeah. Like it doesn't do the Descendants thing where like they have the same letters. <laughs> we have Cher Horowitz as the protagonist who is a spoiled, beautiful, rich teen valley girl who decides in Emma fashion that she is going to take on this girl named Ty and kind of mold her into this new popular creature and she tries to match make her. And Clueless is obviously a cult classic. Uh, a lot of people our age grew up watching and loving it. I think it's a good movie. We're not gonna like rank it along with the other Emma adaptations. Not in the same way. It's most certainly an ad adaptation. In many ways it's the most creative one because yes. it's such a departure from the original material. As time has shown, Clueless really stands up on its own merit, not just as an Emma adaptation. And it is a film that you can enjoy without that knowledge, Yes, I think. absolutely. It enriches your experience, but it's not at all necessary. And I mean, there are certainly some things that have kind of dated it in an unfortunate way. The thing with Christian, you know, being gay and yeah. all that stuff and and Some I've, slang that we generally think of as not good anymore. Another critique I had, well both of us had I think, is perhaps a bit more to do with the fan base, is that a lot of people seem to confuse Sher Horowitz with Elle Woods. 100% she is shallow and conceited and so pretentious. And she doesn't change a huge amount. Like, she doesn't become less materialistic. She doesn't become less of who she is, which, again, is fine. I think a lot of people give Cher a ton of credit. Like, something that I've seen taken out of context a lot, especially in recent years, is like the the argument that she gives in debate class. Right at the beginning of the film. Right at the beginning of the film. And I don't know if anybody like actually knows what debate 
is, but you are given a position to defend or refute. You don't get a choice in that. It's part of the class structure. And so a lot of people use that quote where she gives this really weak anecdote about like why we should let immigrants in and everybody uses that and it's like, yay, shares like our woke babe. And I'm like, eh. it's her weakest class because her arguments are not well researched. They are weak and anecdotal and she can't convince the professor to give her a better grade because of it. And I'm like, good. She's not a good student. She largely gets good grades because she is able to manipulate her teachers into liking her more. And I think perhaps to redirect us slightly back onto the to topic of Emma, something interesting about that is that it does adapt Emma's manipulative yes. streak. But I think that's a departure from the character of Emma that we see in other adaptations and probably in the book. Mm -hmm. In that I think Emma Woodhouse would probably be better at debate club. It's a very masterfully made movie. It is exactly what it wants to be and then it's down to taste as to whether you like it or not. And it's consistent and the pacing's good and there are a lot of really memorable scenes. And everyone in it is doing it, is acting. Well, great. I mean, it's also really funny. I don't think we're gonna get something that's gonna be better than Clueless in terms of inventiveness. Like, yeah. it's really hard to adapt Jane Austen for the modern day. Yeah. And Clueless makes it look really easy. So much of what Austen wrote about at the time was societal conventions that are no longer at all applicable to our modern day lives. But the, the cleverness of Clueless is finding that they can be mappable to dynamics in high school in the 90s. Absolutely. Before we move on from Clueless, our one big gripe revolves around the relationship, the relationship. between her and the knightly character uh, played by Paul Rudd as her ex-stepbrother. Ex -step they so, still share someone they both consider a dad. I don't understand why they felt the need to include that. In the book, Knightley is her brother-in-law. 16 years older, which is still a, a bit. thing. With Emma being 21, I don't want to be that person that's like, Oh, at the time! But like, also, there was a greater in the amount context. of it in the context of the novel. like and It makes a bit more sense than yeah. Cher being 16. The other aspect that bothers me is that the film basically starts out by having Cher say that a high school girl dating a high school boy is is not done. And then the film goes on to fulfill that as being correct. Yeah. By having her end up with a college guy. Maybe it's just 2020 sensibilities. I wanted that to be interrogated and it obviously And it wasn't. wasn't. It was 100% just confirmed as a thing, you should think. Eventually I want to make a video about the fact that there's so much media, especially when I was a kid, that I felt like encouraged. Um, young girls to like date significantly older guys and by that I mean a gap of like you know high school to college. Paul Rudd is extremely likable in this role. He is. But he's too old to be dating his 16 year old ex-stepsister. That feels like a really obvious sentence. Yes. And yet. And yet. 16! I would give the movie a little bit more slack if she was 18. Yeah. Even then I would still and find it a little squeaky. We spent, we the, spent whole the whole film thinking she was a senior, like 18. Yeah. And then like last five minutes she's like, like I'm, I'm 16. 16. And we were like, oh no. no. It ruins Cher. the film for me a bit. Especially because to me, it's not even that he likes her because Cher is so mature by the end of the movie. Cher still largely acts like an immature she's the same, child. She is the same person. She's just got better at dealing with the specific people around her. So largely I would say that our feelings were that people seem to have uh, romanticized what Cher is really like because yeah. Cher is spoiled and entitled and I don't think this is a movie that would be made today. I know that they're apparently going to remake it um, because it is so popular but it's I don't think... It's so hard think... to see it being made today in the way it is because we want to eat the rich and we will. We have tons of films within the last couple of years that have been incredibly critical of the elite. And and this and... is a film that's like, but what about rich people's problems? How about we wrap up this segment and go on to 1996? We enjoyed Clueless. It is certainly a time capsule. Yeah. And there are things about it that I do not think age great, but it's still an enjoyable movie and we are absolutely not judging you or saying you're a bad person if you like it and enjoy it. But let's roll on to 1996. We got two 
We have two from 1996. What are we starting with? Miramax's film. The Gwyneth Paltrow vehicle. Run from. This one came out just a year later. It stars Gwyneth Paltrow as Emma. It has Tony Collette as Harriet Smith. This is just a straight kind of by the by uh, it's, it's adaptation. An adaptation. Of, of Emma. Set in the Regency era, set when it came out. Mm -hmm. and As will all of the following. Let me just consult my notes. We have Jeremy Northam as Knightley. Kind of forgettable Knightley. A couple of pivotal moments that I think to do with Emma and Knightley in the story are first, the argument they have after Emma has recommended that Harriet turn um. Mr. Martin down and then later on the revelation of Knightley's feelings for Emma. And the picnic. And the picnic. The early argument kind of lets us down with yeah. Jeremy Northam and Gwyneth Paltrow. They have decent chemistry. They but do, and they're doing archery yeah. while they argue. Archery argument. This feels very 90s in yes. its adaptation. It feels very... Um, Reverent. Very like warm, fuzzy feelings about the idea of like living in Regency England. Doesn't it just sound so romantic? It's very serious about that idea. We just found it really kind of boring and slow at the beginning. And then actually in the latter half, it really did pick up quite a bit. The editing became a lot quicker. The jokes there were, were some funnier. Really funny transitions and cuts. of like cuts from one character saying something and then finishing the same sentence in a completely different manner and situation. Yeah, and we liked that, and when it got into that, we were a bit more engaged by it. But ultimately, I certainly never really got over that very reverent feeling. And really, it did kind of feel like poor filmmaking that it started so slow, that like yeah. it was such a film of two halves, not consistent in how it was presented. Some good things, like we really enjoyed Toni Collette as Harriet. 100% the standout performance in that movie. She Absolutely. is so good. Having listened to the little bit of Emma, the book that we have so far, in the way that she is shown in this film, Toni Collette embodies the physical description of Harriet as somewhat short and plump. The Miss Bates for yes. <laughs> Gwyneth Paltrow's 1996 Emma was also a highlight. In Sophie Thompson, Emma Thompson's sister. Mm -hmm. And Sophie Thompson is in uh, a version of Persuasion that I really love. And she is also in the film that you love. To called death. Relative Values, which I talked about in my five favorite movies. And Miss Bates is a character that we can now bring up because she doesn't really figure in Clueless, this Not is the at first all. time we're talking about her, but Miss Bates is boorish. Very talkative, unmarried, middle-aged, looking after her widowed mother. It's her niece, Jane Fairfax, that's another character in this novel. And like, Who's spoken of and then turns up. We have this pivotal scene in Emma where Emma says something extremely careless because she doesn't really like Miss Bates. She finds her kind of annoying, so she kind of just lets herself say something really mean and cutting and it really, really hurts Miss Bates' feelings. And it's this big kind of turning moment of Emma realizing the things that I do have an impact on other people. And Especially I given be... that Mr. Knightley gives her an earful oh, yeah. afterwards. I would actually draw a link between Sophie Thompson's Miss Bates and Miranda Hart's Miss Bates in 2020. Who will be our, yeah. Who's our favorite. So Sophie Thompson very much has the giggly energy. She also has the like alternating between like very demure and like respectful of Miss Woodhouse and how kind she is. And then also shouting at her mother in a very funny way. And it's really great. I think it does the romantic climax really well. I think it might be the best romantic climax. It is very sincere and it is very romantic. And basically that is the realization of Emma and Knightley at the same time that they love each other. And that's very well done in this film, but ultimately we just kind of felt like there was not really a lot of critique about the society in general. Something that permeates Jane Austen's work, good adaptations of Austen kind of show the stratifications of the class system at work. I just think for us personally, it just doesn't really speak to us, something that we would want to watch over and over again. Not every adaptation has to reinvent its source material. I think that's a very sort of of our time thing. As it is becoming more mainstream to kind of critically analyze like our reverence for the past and whatnot. But I think that's some, that those are things that we respond to. Yeah, it's something we find interesting. Nothing was really wrong with it, but it just felt very plain. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we can move on. Um, Wait a uh, second! We do want to just pour one out for Ewan McGregor's wig. 
It's that league. really bad. He was fine. He was okay as Frank Churchill. He wasn't the best Frank Churchill. No. He was kind of forgettable. Paul Ewan McGregor, three years before Obi-Wan Kenobi. Alright, that's it. Yeah. yeah. This is Emma, 1996 part two. But or... it, it was... But what about poor Henry? God. It was made for and released on the British network ITV. It was actually written by Andrew Davies one year after he wrote Pride and Prejudice, the BBC miniseries, which is one of my favorite pieces of visual stuff to watch ever. This was a fun one, I thought. We have Kate Beckinsale, we have Samantha Morton as Harriet. We have Mark Strong as Knightley. I wouldn't have recognized him had you not pointed out to me that he's the villain in the first Sherlock Holmes he is Robert also, Downey Jr. movie. He is also the villain in Stardust and he is also the Scottish guy in the Kingsman movies who sings country roads and then blows up. He brings like this very strong, yelly... Strong. Not strong. <sighs> okay. I think it's an improvement certainly on Luna Paltrow. We certainly liked it more. We found the first half of it quite engaging, but as the film went on we actually felt like it faltered a little. Bit of an opposite kind of switched problem. The advantage of Kate Beckinsale's portrayal of Emma is she's the she's... only not blonde one <laughs> there's also the fact that she is the spikiest really I'd say perhaps until this year she is the one who wears her cruelty on her sleeve the most mm -hmm. a scene that's kind of a, a fun test of this of each portrayal is when Emma is not advising Harriet to turn Robert Martin down because in some adaptations we see her pretending better <laughs> to step away and yeah. say it's your choice I'm not going to advise you. Suffice to say there's a balancing act going on in that scene I think where Emma is very much trying to get her way and make Harriet refuse Martin. But, but also have the plausible deniability of being able to say like, oh well it's your choice you decided. And then as soon as Harriet's like, I think I have quite almost made up my mind to refuse, refuse Robert Martin, she can be like, yes. And I think that Kate Beckinsale is one of the more obvious ones yeah. in this scene. I think the picnic scene is pretty well done. Yeah. I mean, part of that is not as good as it could be just because, like, Miss Bates is forgettable. We had Prunella Scales as Miss Bates, who some people may know from Falsy Towers, and she was fine. She's fine. She was fine, but she didn't really stand out in the same way. And she's also not in it a whole lot, so no. the, her insult at the picnic doesn't really feel this is, very significant. This is a fascinating theme that actually runs through this, is that there is so much stuffed into this story, it's kind of like stuffing something in and something pops out again. If you focus on one aspect of Emma, it does seem to be that you have to lose focus on another aspect. Yeah. And none of these adaptations, except for maybe the 2009 one, which has the benefit of four episodes in space, yeah. managed to get full focus. Miss Bates is definitely one of those things that we think is pretty important. This film was also quite weird in fun ways and in weird ways. It starts with the chickens being robbed and we the were like, from stolen. Hartfield, it's from... like, help, I'm being stolen! Hey, I'm being stolen! Hey, help me! Help me! And then right at the end... The chicken stealers are back! The last thing we see in the film <laughs> is a chicken robbery. It was very odd. It was this... very odd and some context was given for it because it was like... But Daddy, don't you want Knightley around so that he can stop the chicken robbers? <laughs> The end of the film is just like, uh-oh, here we go again. We don't feel that devotion. For the period and for the perception of this kind of storytelling. A lot of comedy is derived from kind of seeing the ways the, the help kind of have to put up with the rich people. That's actually something that is also super prominent in 2020's version. But... And the unique thing about this adaptation that I felt was interesting and often very funny were cutaways of Emma fantasizing about what would happen if her schemes worked yeah. and also one which I alluded to But what about little Henry? These dream sequences were so odd Very brief and very much like using a heightened reality and slightly different cinematography. And they were funny. Smash zoom. They're, they are very odd. Yeah. And they add a little bit of spark. They and also I, feel very 90s. For me, 
it was less concerned about being fantasy fodder for the at-home viewer. It like actually felt a little bit more Austin to me. We enjoyed it for that, but at the same time, it did slow down. It did it, slow down, and then end with a chicken robbery for <laughs> some reason. We have a couple of really notable casting choices in here, for us particularly. I've been showing Sarah Bond films. We will be I have watched almost all of them at this point. She has seen 20 Bond films. It's a lot of Bond! And suffice to say, we will be doing a video about this at some point. But, with Pierce Brosnan, we have... The aptly on. named Samantha Bond. Come on as Money Penny, and she's pretty great. And in this one, Samantha Bond plays Mrs. Weston. Um, She's Emma's former governess. Who, the one who has been matched by Emma with Mr. Weston. Part of Emma's motivation for befriending Harriet is that she feels a bit of loneliness. She feels a space left in her household by Miss Taylor, her friend, and she no longer feels like she has somebody who she can really talk to and spend her time with because Miss Taylor is married now. Another like mark to notice is good chemistry between them and that Mrs. Weston is an interesting character to watch. The moments that really test her character are when she's having fun gossiping about Jane Fairfax and who gave her the piano forte. Mm. 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 <laughs> it's really gonna help you if you know about Emma <laughs> watching this <Yes>. video. <laughs> Go read the synopsis, come back, <laughs> or just watch all of the versions like, like we, we did. did. <laughs> But Samantha Bond is a great Mrs. Weston, I she think. She is great. Now, do you remember the name of the guy who played Frank Churchill? No, I do not. I will put it here. Oh, of course. He, he. is young Ebenezer Scrooge in The Muppet Christmas Carol. He I mean, looks exactly the same because, of course, it's period as well. And it was so delightful. Mm. What other notes do we have? Okay, oh yeah, oh yes. So as we mentioned, Knightley and Emma have an age difference of about 16 years. Was this the one? This is the one where he mentions not once but twice, and honestly... I held you as a baby. Oh my god. And now I'm going to kiss you after proposing to you. Oh, it just... Okay, if there's ever a moment to not bring up the that fact. you knew somebody as a baby. George, she was a baby. I held you in in my arms when you were three weeks old, and then he kisses her, and then they get engaged. And I, we were like, oh, that's, no. Ooh. You didn't say that. Andrew, why? Why, why did you Andrew? write that? There was a really weird moment where Jane Fairfax compares being a governess to, to slavery. slavery. Ooh. In like specifically referring to abolition. Yeah. So yes, that's slavery. That's slavery. That's slavery. And we were like, oh, this ain't it. No. <laughs> I just don't know if Andrew Davies was trying to make it like relevant or something, like some kind of, you know. But he, he didn't. But he, it didn't quite didn't land. It. No. It, it really just felt like you were comparing being a governess to being an yeah. enslaved person. And that was no weird. Yeah. It was weird. Fine not to have that. And a film of some peaks and troughs and some really weird moments. Yes. I would ultimately say it's a good version. We liked it more than Gwyneth Paltrow, but it's certainly not like my highest. No. But from here we go 13 years. Into the future. With 2009's BBC miniseries Romola Garay and Johnny Lee Miller as Emma and Knightley respectively. And you will know Johnny Lee Miller from Elementary. Romola Garay, funny thing, she's the lead in she... Dirty Dancing Havana Nights. She's great in this. It was written by Sandy Welch and she also wrote BBC's 2006 Jane Eyre adaptation, which I really like, and it's also on Hulu. Let's just kind of talk generally. It's four episodes. Each episode's about 50 minutes long. I really enjoy the, like, kind of coziness of it. It You're has the same it. coziness as Pride and Prejudice 1995. A thing that I've noticed about a lot of Austen's novels is that there is very often an element of mystery that is kind of woven into the story. Here we have the mystery of Frank Churchill and Jane Fairfax have a couple of scenes together. He frequently visits her at her aunt's house. Somebody sends Jane Fairfax a piano forte and there's no return address and everybody's wondering who it is. I'm a bit disappointed that with all of the room that they had in this series, they really nail the idea that like Frank is very like flirty with Emma. What they don't nail is the the clues that you get that Jane and Frank have some sort of attachment. All of the other 
adaptations that we've watched have done that mystery a lot better by actually giving you the clues to possibly see it coming. In the miniseries, it feels like almost completely out of nowhere. I think that Roma Liberi is probably my favourite Emma. In general, she doesn't have all the acerbicness that may be more true to her character, but she is the most balanced. And she's she... the most likeable. She's not necessarily like sickly sweet, but she's upbeat. Well, what's interesting is that I think she plays her from this perspective of like somebody who really 100% believes that everything that she thinks and feels is like totally the right thing to feel. I think she's actually the closest to Cher Horowitz. There's an argument pretty early on that's a pretty pivotal moment in this story where Knightley and her, we've mentioned it earlier, have Argue this argument. About Harriet and Robert Martin. Yes, and I think this might be my favourite. They're both so good at it. And you can really tell in Johnny Lee Miller the frustration he has over his friend to be incredibly bloody minded and contrary. You know that what you're saying is rubbish. Yeah. I think one of the things that makes that scene so effective is that like they properly yell at each other and they properly like have this rift between them. It's also framed as like the end of an episode. Yeah. So like you feel that distance because the episode ends. And it's staged really well as well, technically. Yes. Like it passes Arguing through them. various rooms yes. with pauses and quiet moments and then explosions. Yeah. The intensity of that fight makes it really satisfying and believable that like they need to kind of come back together and apologize after this big fight. In ways that others aren't. And in a film context it can happen so quickly. There's really a lot that I like about it so I think I'm kind of being a bit more Zooming in a bit more on the critical pink things. Yes, just to be a little bit more fair. I think that Michael Gambon is really, really, really good as her dad. Agoraphobic, very much anxious about her leaving him and anxious about other things around him. I've seen some complaints about Johnny Lee Miller just because like, from the very beginning, he and Romola Garai have such good chemistry that it feels like They're we different. are moving towards their romantic climax, which we are. But, at the same time, that's not really what the book is totally I, about. And I think another thing is that his knightly is very personable in general. We see the scene where Martin asks him his advice on whether he should ask Harriet to marry him. Yeah. And Mr. Knightley is very kind about it. To go from that, like, that's what makes him being angry so effective to me. Mm -hmm. Is that his Mr. Knightley wants to like people and wants to be personable. Mm -hmm and definitely isn't quite as grumpy as others. So what about the picnic scene here? I think the picnic scene is done pretty well here. It's one of the more harsh. It is, and I think it's because it's kind of like the whole being greater than the sum of its parts, really just because I think a lot of times in these adaptations that we've watched, the picnic scene is the result of her saying the wrong thing at the wrong time and everybody's embarrassed and then she's embarrassed and it kind of ends. And here it's like this amping up of tension and you can just kind of feel that it's getting worse it and more uncomfortable. It continues to get worse even after Miss Bates leaves. Like that's another scene that's like a very big deal. And I think it's very, very well done in the 2009 series, especially because Miss Bates, she's actually quite prominent throughout, so you get a sense of like how deeply it cuts. But she is a much more, she's much more played straight. She and is she's, more sad. She is more sad. And in that way, it does feel sad, quite sad in its own way when yeah. she gets roasted, for want of a better word. Like you said, this is the second one you watched because, yeah. we, you know, we yeah. saw Emma 2020 at the beginning of March and, and we then... we started watching this a couple and of then, days later. Dang, and it did give me on? a good basis for the rest of it. And I think that is a really big strength of it. And to me, it does just feel super comfy to like sink into that world and like get to just be around them for a while. It's not super self-aware or anything like that. I think in the way that 90s ones are very 90s, this is a very sort of late 2000s feel of like, not necessarily super self-aware, but not quite as reverent. Yeah. Very just as it is. And also I would argue that despite how charming Romola Garai is, like we've talked about kind of how like relatable and kind of kind she really can be. She says really mean, awful, classist, pretentious, elitist stuff. I think it works in a totally different way than 
you know, the other Emmas, wherein you would expect somebody who's acidic to say mean, classist things. These things you sting a little harsher because from a... Because you're like, but she's... you're so relatable! Like, yeah. her relationship with Harriet is done pretty well because we just have more time to spend yeah. with Harriet. Harriet has a habit of disappearing sometimes in some of the adaptations, I in think. In the middle, when the story focuses a bit more on Frank Churchill and Jane Fairfax. I think, honestly, having just rewatched it last night, I think 2020 does the best incorporation of Harriet throughout the whole story. One last thing I have to say about uh, 2009 is that one of my favourite bits was right at the end after the very genuinely sincerely sweet declaration scene between Knightley and Emma. Mm -hmm. Immediately following that. You know I love you and I always will but we can never marry. That's all. It's just a very it funny moment. It was so moment. funny! And the final thing that I think is really fun about the 2009 version is that you 100% can watch it with the idea that this is a slight sort of queer story. From the very beginning, this version of Emma is very vehement about the fact that like she doesn't think she ever will fall in love, she doesn't feel affection like that, it's just not in her nature. You can like definitely headcanon like Emma as like ace. And or a romantic. Yes, especially with like the language that she uses to describe it. I think you can really see it as this transition from kind of realizing and thinking that, you know, she's ace to realizing she's demi. And I thought that was really interesting. And I'm not saying that I think that that was intentional. I just mean like that is subtext there that I think you can find and I don't think it's that difficult. And the puzzlement that she expresses over her feelings for Frank Churchill <laughs> very much kind of mirrors things I've seen from aromantic people especially talking about how they've Absolutely. tried to figure out Am I feeling this thing that everyone else says they feel? It could be interpreted in a less conventional way. Yes. In a less arrow romantic or arrow sexual way. And I like that aspect of it. I think it's something that to me personally it stands out a little bit from the it's others. It's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of very interesting, shall we get to the final one? Emma 2020 or Emma! Emma 2020, directed by Autumn de Wilde, who is an American mm -hmm. director. Mm -hmm. This is actually her directorial debut, so yep. good for her. She's primarily a photographer. She previously directed a segment of a very fun half-documentary kind of film called Six by Sondheim. But this is her Thorin debut, and it is great. It is! It's really very good. It's really funny. We think it's worth the $20 rent. Yeah. On demand at the moment. It's not like with Little Women, where no. we were like, you should go watch this yeah. movie, because it's a fantastic movie. In this time of man's great innocence. Innocence? Innocence? No? Emma is very funny, and it has a wonderful aesthetic. It very much has an aesthetic. Oh, yeah. In a way that others don't necessarily. And also, for me, it feels like a family-friendly version of The Favourite. Yes. And it is family-friendly. Yeah. And we saw in, The Favourite together in And The, the Favourite is not family-friendly, but yeah. it's very much like rich people being weird and often moving and talking weirdly. In a very absurd but also artful way. And interesting cinematography and like a mix of naturalistic acting and mm -hmm. very much not. We have Anya Taylor-Joy as Emma. Mia Goff as Harriet. Bill Nye as Mr. Uh Woodhouse, who is fantastic. I don't know if I would say he's my favorite because he's just different. I think Michael Gambon is my favorite. I think Michael Gambon is probably the best. Yeah. But Bill Nye is just different. Mm -hmm. I feel a chill draft. <laughs> He's a delight. Johnny Flynn, who is a South African musician and actor. He actually wrote and performs the song that is in the ending credits, which mm -hmm. is lovely. And Miranda Hart as Miss And Ms. Miranda Bates. Hart as Miss Bates, who is... The like, best Miss Bates! That this is an instance in which we're going... in which we can unequivocally say that we have a preference. Yes. And it's Miranda Hart. Yeah, whether who, or not she is objectively the best in terms of faithfulness to the source material or whatever... It doesn't matter. She's so funny! UK folks will best know Miranda Hart for appearances on panel shows, occasional stand-up, and her self-titled sitcom, and also being in Call the Midwife. Other people will know her primarily from this, and the Paul Teague 
Melissa McCarthy film Spy. In the way that we felt like Tony Collette really stood out as a performance. Embodied in like a a stellar version of Harriet. She was the standout performance to us, but we didn't really feel like, oh, you have got to watch this for Tony Collette. Miranda Hart is worth watching this film for. Yeah, She's like, that th funny. Yeah. We must have you all to Hartfield. Oh, oh mother, do you hear? <laughs> We laughed at it in the cinema. We laughed at it on TV, and we laughed at our video we took of it through Instagram. <laughs> She's just so ecstatic all the time that when we get to the picnic scene, it is absolutely gut-wrenching to have Emma, like, cut her in the way that she does. Miranda Hart in the picnic scene is kind of like that moment in the Simpsons episode I showed you very recently. Watch this, Lise. You can actually pinpoint the second when his heart rips in half. It hurts so much because, as you've said, she is so effusive for the rest of the movie that when she's extinguished, it's incredibly noticeable. And the, the ensuing shouting match between Knightley and Emma is very humbling, especially from more the way of a it's filmed and staged. Like, here it is more of a shouting match because in other adaptations, I think it's more Knightley berating her in a one-sided way and she doesn't have much fight back. But then in 2020 there's a great moment where Emma, who is in a carriage, nightly is below, like looking up at her. Yeah, standing Emma on the Emma just ground. like stands up and is like, no! And she starts to like fight back but he like cuts her off. And then she's kind of left broken in the same way that Miss yeah. Bates was. And it's really sad. Mia Goth as Harriet is I think the most consistent Harriet and Mia Goth always has something to do and she's great at it. Yeah. And she embodies like this awkward not quite sure of herself, girl, yeah. who then also becomes more sure and is like, I did this because you said I should. You can see that moment where she kind of realizes that Emma has been manipulating her and that she's been wrong to have such unerring adoration for her. I think this is the funniest Mr. Elton. He is so full of himself. And this carriage scene where Mr. Elton <laughs> proposes to Emma. This Mr. Elton is so angry. <laughs> it also works because we've seen him drink throughout the party. Yeah. So it makes sense that he would have a little bit more of a like dramatic blow up. I would say that in this, like Mrs. Elton's presence feels a little unnecessary because she doesn't really play a role. She's, she's relatively pleasant, visually and musically. Everything about the aesthetics is intentional. Yeah, something that I really loved, because we watched it again last night to make sure that we would have it fresh in our minds for this video, the score does not fade into the background. It wants you to notice it, and I can really appreciate that. In almost an old-fashioned way, and it's a great score, it's a mixture of compositions and classical and traditional folk music. It gives a really great texture to the film that I think is uh, missing a little bit in the other ones. Yeah, um, and the contrast between the choral, the choral stuff and the folk stuff illustrates the class stuff as well, which is also illustrated in the ensemble work by the, the servants. Yes, so this is a version that often will use the reactions of the servants in the face of this just absurdity of... To whatever business is going on in the scene. And it's just so well done, and it's something that feels so Austin. Whenever the service staff can be used in a scene, they are. I think that it's especially smart because it doesn't try to delve too deeply into it. It's just very simple. It's... And it gets its idea across of, man, these rich people are ridiculous. Yeah, and that's an element that I think it shares with the favorite. Uh, and their costumes, like... Oh my god, the costumes. You want to talk about the costumes? Yes, I do. I feel like every Austin adaptation that I have seen has very forgettable costume design. You have the same dress every single scene, but it's like in a slightly different color. And there's never any differentiation between like somebody who, like Harriet, who is poor and growing up in a in a boarding school, and somebody like Emma Woodhouse, who's like really rich. And that bothers me because it doesn't really add much to the visual kind of landscape of the film or, you know, TV series or whatever. But and here, yeah. we have high starched collars that look really, really ridiculous because that's what they wore. And we have 
just really gorgeous like ruffles and different kinds of like embroidery. Emma wears something different almost every single scene and it makes sense because she's rich. And then like, we also see the work that goes into putting these clothes on, particularly with Knightley. Yes. N with Knightley's introduction where he, where he is dressed. Yeah. By his footman. And I feel like there was a lot of devotion and care that went into the styling of the different characters in terms of like what the fashions actually were. Like, and I think this must be partly to do with having a, a photographer as a director. I just find the costumes in this to be leagues above almost every other Austin thing I've They're seen. They're entertaining in their own right. I think also something we wanted to mention is that this is the only one that kind of flirts with the idea of a little bit of queerness between Harriet and Emma, a very tiny little bit. And we're also not saying that it's queer baity. No. Like it's not trying to no. do anything, it's just there if you want to yeah. so check it out a bit. Like Paige recently finished reading Emma and she told me that her thought kind of is like, oh, the reason that Emma picks Harriet is because Emma likes Harriet. It's because she's in love with her. And I like, I having not read the book, I think that's a pretty decent way to look at it. Yeah. Given the way that she treats her. And I think here that idea is engaged with a little bit. I, I feel like it is more on Emma's side. Emma has the attachment. Yeah. So ultimately I do feel like you benefit from going into this one with a bit of understanding about the source material. Just because it moves through it so fast. I Times. did enjoy it better for having all that background. Yes. Three different versions, four if you can't clear this. Yeah. And so speaking of that, how about we wrap up and think about like, how do we rank these? Obviously, once again, haven't read the book. Mm -hmm. This isn't about faithfulness of to the source material. This is just about our personal feelings and what we enjoy in films mm -hmm. and, you know, visual media because mm -hmm. it's obviously the one TV show. I think 2009 and 2020 are my favorites. Same. There is no perfect Emma, but if you enjoy both of those, then you get a like complete meal of what adapting Emma is. For me personally, I would rank Gwyneth Paltrow's at the bottom, yeah, just because same. I enjoyed it the least. Same. Beck and Sale in the middle. And no, then, I think that's pretty simple actually. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then I think 2009 and 2020 are tied for completely different reasons. 2009 is like my comfort watch, when I just kind of get to swim around in the world and be soothed. And then 2020 is the one that I watch like as a, you know, standalone kind of experience that is very funny, but also beautiful to look at, but like not as comforting, doesn't hold my hand quite as much. Both good in their own ways. What about our favorite Emma? Right, yes. Mm. Mm. I think, I think Roma and Garai. I think me. Anya Taylor-Joy kind of beats it out a little bit for me. It's I think they're very close. Like, not close in style, but close in quality. Our favorite Emma and Knightley? I, I think for me it's definitely 2009. They have the best fights, they yep. have the best reconciliations, yep. and I think they have a really sweet romantic kind of scene at the yep. end, and I think they are my favorite. Best Harriet? I think I'm gonna go with Mia Goth. I agree. She's I agree. really I think, good. Yeah. I don't think we need to go through all the characters, no. but we can reiterate before we wrap things up that that Unequivocally, the best Miss Bates is Miranda Hart. No competition. Yeah. The others are good, but they're not great. And I think that's about it. It's been a fun project to embark on. Yeah. Thank you for introducing it to me. Thank you for being game. I thought you were going to say thank you for being gay, and I'm like, you're very welcome. Thank you for being gay. We have fun here. We would ultimately recommend seeing Emma at Home, the new one, just because if you have a couple of people in your household that all want to watch it, I do think it's worth it. It is family friendly, I think, enough that if you have kids in the household... And they're interested in Austin. There are aspects that they won't they won't enjoy as much, but it's not like rude. It's not, there's nothing good you have to worry about. So thank you so much for watching. 
If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up. In the comments below, let us know your favorite Austin adaptation or if there's an Emma adaptation that you like that either we didn't watch for this video or that you feel like we were unjustly critical of, please let us know your thoughts in the comments. If there is an Emma anime that we should watch, tell us. Don't worry, I am working on the Good Omens video. It's just gonna take a little bit longer for me to write it and edit it, and but it is coming. We have all the time in the world at the moment. Mm. And if you enjoyed this video, subscribe for more videos on Disney, intersectional feminism, pop culture critiques, Jane Austen, and, and more. more. One of us will see you real soon. <laughs> I'm trying to like hit you <laughs> in the face with my hair <laughs> without cracking our it. skulls against each other. You want to try again? Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay.